Now, there's a little presumptuous to call this chaos theory because, as a matter of fact, there is no theory. We're in the exploration phase now, and this is experimental mathematics that we, we are doing with supercomputers. But um, I think it, it might uh, help if you had just a little idea of chaotic dynamics and the idea of the thing. So I want to give a two or three minute primer so that you could understand what is a chaotic attractor. And here, now we've seen 16,000 of them. What does one look like? And, uh, and that will conclude my introduction, and then I'll pass them on to Rupert. So a good uh, laboratory for the study of chaotic dynamics is the dripping faucet. And uh, the dripping faucet was discovered as the ideal demonstrator for chaos theory because the lectures are usually given in a physics uh, lecture hall, and they always seem to have a sink with a faucet in the front to do experiments or for the professor to wash the chalk off his hands. Anyway, you take the faucet, you can do this immediately you get home. Uh, you crack the tap a little bit, and the water drips out, drip, 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 and it's regular. If you crack a little more, then the drips speed up, but they're regular. And then you crack it a little more, and then it begins to sound drip, 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 like rain dripping off the roof. That's an example of a chaotic time series. If you measure the time between drops and make a list of these numbers, you have the uh, paradigmatic case of a chaotic time series. Now, somebody decided to seriously study this dripping faucet after seeing it in half a dozen physics lectures. And this person, Rob Shaw, one of the leading people in chaos theory, did a very fine study by placing a microphone in the sink where the drop would hit it, getting an electronic beat, dis discretizing, getting it in the computer, and analyzing the results. And so all of this is taking place on that level one, the lowest layer of the physical world. Then he made a mathematical model on level three. He went up there, he made a mathematical model for the, the water drop gets bigger and bigger, so it's characterized by a certain mass. When the mass reaches a critical value, the drop falls off. And from this mathematical model, he then wrote a program, a computer program on level two, and ran it and produced data that was exactly like the experimental data from level one. So this is an example showing the the value of modeling on these three levels for gaining some understanding. There's sort of a hermeneutical circle. You look at the data, try to build a model, you, you fail. But building the model tells you to observe in a different way. You observe in this different way. That helps you to build a better model. And as this circle turns, the level of our understanding grows. So Rob Shaw came quickly to a good model for this. I think he was lucky because it's sounds simple, it's a very complicated system. It relates to waterfalls, for example, when the spray comes off the waterfall. And here's another example of a chaotic system. Could you write some equations and obtain a computer program that simulated the spray from a waterfall? I doubt it. The new way of looking at the data that came to him from the theory was to take the sequence of numbers the time between drops. You just visualize a column of numbers. And you make a carbon copy of it and move it over to the side. And then you whack one number off the top and move it all up one number. Now you have a series of pairs. And then you plot these pairs on the plane as a set of points. So he did this. There's a film or video available for Aerial Press that shows the machine actually doing this. and from this totally chaotic data, viewed in this particular way, which is called chaoscopy, you get these points in the planes that if the data was really random, the dots would be all over the plane. Instead, they lie on a curve, a smooth curve. So from the observation of the data in this way, the smoothness of the curve suggests a kind of model that you can actually take off the shelf in the building where the chaos theorists are working and apply it to your data, you see. And the simplest model on the shelf of the chaos theorist's closet 
<clears throat> is called the logistic equation. It produces a series of numbers that are apparently random, but actually they comprise one of these simple geometric figures, this curve, that the da data plotted in this special way of the chaos scope is a curve, and that is called the chaotic attractor. So there are models on level three, which are good models for understanding certain behavior on level one. And level two is an intermediary, which can either create the model, the mathematical model from the real data, or create experimental data from the model to compare with laboratory data. Well, to conclude, this video was made out of these simplest possible dynamical systems called the logistic equation. And it just produces a series it's very similar to a dripping faucet. So you could just as well imagine that we have 16,000 dripping faucets in an array of 128 by 128. And the time between drops is represented as a color on the screen. Now, do you think that if you had 16,000 dripping faucets, you could get out of them a pattern like Calico Mountain? Now, well, it happens. I mean, it's, there's a lot of theory behind this, enough to suggest that it's not some kind of artifact. No matter what kind of artifact it is, it's an interesting artifact. And I guess I'd like to call this a mathematical law. It has to do with the emergence of form from a field of chaos. We don't know what else to call it. It's not a mathematical law that was known to Pythagoras. And I don't know if it was always there since the beginning of time, long before the Big Bang, or if it just emerged into the evolving field of the guy in mind through the fact that computers make it visible. I mean, I don't know. But at, at, the, <laughs> at uh, this point, I have, uh, I hope, arrived at an actual connection between the work I routinely do as a specialist in the field of chaos and the discourse that we're trying to carry on here to increase our understanding of our past, our future, and our possibility of even having a future. The problem I have with chaos theory is that I'm never quite sure what it's saying. There, there seem to me to be two things that are of interest here. One is that the actual detailed models which chaos theoreticians make and they love finding fairly simple equations that will generate complicated and seemingly chaotic structures. Um, and so th there's this modeling aspect of chaos which is at the forefront of modern mathematical chaos theory and modeling. But the fact you can make mathematical models of chaos has given scientists permission to recognize that in fact there's a vast deal of indeterminacy uh, throughout the physical world. In the 19th century, it was generally believed that there was no indeterminacy at all. Everything in the physical world was totally conditioned by eternal laws of nature. Laplace thought that the whole future and past of the universe could be calculated from its present state if there were a mind powerful enough to do the calculations and to make the observations. Um, now, that view, the illusion of total predictability, uh, held science under its spell for generations. Scientists were dazzled by this imagined power of totally predicting everything. And it was a kind of illusion. They really did believe it. Um, and, of course, they couldn't calculate everything. I mean, they couldn't even, they still can't even calculate the weather um, very accurately more than a few days in advance. So, in actual fact, this idea of total predictability was not realizable. But the idea was, well, we would, uh, if we could do enough calculations, be able to calculate it in principle. What seems to me interesting is the fact that first with quantum mechanics, there was a recognition that indeterminacy, probability, um, intrinsic, non-detailed predictability were inherent in small-scale physical processes at the quantum level. And here was a genuine indeterminism in nature which had to be admitted in 1927. Until then, practically everyone believed everything was fully determinate. 
after that, there's been a gradual recognition that indeterminacy um, exists not just at the quantum level, but at all levels of natural organization. There's an inherent spontaneity in determinism, probabil probabilism, uh, in the weather, in the breaking of waves, in turbulent flow, in nervous systems, in living organisms, in biochemical cycles, in a whole range of phenomena. Even the old-time favorite model for total rational mathematical order, namely the orbits of the solar system, the orbits of the planets in the solar system, turn out to be uh, uh, unpredictable in terms of Newtonian physics. They can be modeled in a chaotic manner. Anyway, this indeterminism is being recognized at all levels of nature. So there's the idea that what we can model with old-style physical models is an abstraction from a very small number of idealized cases, that the natural world simply escapes the modeling, most of the modeling processes which were the dominant features of traditional physics. Now, it seems to me this openness of nature, this indeterminism, this spontaneity, this freedom, is something very interesting, and it corresponds to the intuition of chaos in its intuitive and mythological sense. Mathematicians have used this word chaos in a variety of technical senses, and it's not entirely clear to me how these technical models of chaotic systems correspond to the kind of intuitive uh, notion of chaos. But what I want to do is to consider how form arises from chaos, starting from a simple, intuitively obvious way in which more form appears from less, through familiar physical processes. And I'm thinking of the process of cooling. If you start with something at a very, very high temperature, atoms can't exist. The electrons fly off the nuclei, and you get something called a plasma, which is a sort of soup of atomic nuclei and electrons in a kind of gas. There's no longer individual atoms. The whole thing, they disintegrate into a, a melange, a mixture of their component parts, the plasma which has its own kinds of properties. If you cool these plasmas down, when you reach a certain temperature, it's low enough for atoms to form, and atoms begin to come into existence. Electrons start circulating around nuclei. You get atoms forming. You get a gas of atoms. But the temperature is still too high for any molecules to form. And say it's a hydrogen plasma, and you cool it down, you'll get hydrogen atoms, but you won't yet get any hydrogen molecules. Cool it down further, now you get hydrogen molecules. You cool the system down further, and you get a stage where more complex molecules can come into being. But they're still gaseous. Cool it down further, and they turn into a liquid, which has more form, can form drops and flow around, and has uh, quite complex, ordered arrays of molecules within it. Cool it further still, and you get a crystal, which is an extremely highly, highly regularly ordered formal arrangement of the atoms and the molecules. So you get a progressive increase in complexity of form as you lower the temperature. And in traditional kinetic theory, lowering temperature means less um, random kinetic motion of the particles. So you're getting a cooling down um, and a, an increase in complexity of form as the cooling process takes place. Now, we all know from the cooling of steam into water, the cooling of water into ice, that um, this, we know about this process from everyday experience. We've seen this aspect of it, and we've seen how if you cool water vapor down, you get ice crystals emerging, and these ice crystals have a considerably high degree of order. So there's this formative process, which we see through cooling, occurs as the thermal chaos in the ordinary sort of everyday sense of chaos, is reduced because as cooling happens, more form emerges. The opposite happens if you warm things up. If you warm up snowflakes, they first turn into water, then they turn into steam, then the steam, the water vapor disintegrates into the molecules break up into atoms, then those break up into uh, a plasma as you raise the temperature. So there seems to be an inverse relationship between temperature, which is this highly agitated motion of things, essentially chaotic, in the traditional theory of gases and plasmas, and um, <clears throat> an increase of form when things cool down. 
Now, in a sense, that's what happened, has happened according in the entire universe. We're led to believe that the universe started off exceedingly hot, billions of billions of degrees centigrade, so hot that stable forms were not able to emerge. By expanding, <coughs> it cooled down. The, the cooling process of the universe is associated with expansion. The cosmic expansion both creates more space in which new forms can appear, and by making bigger gaps between things, somehow cools the universe down, so the temperature drops. And as the temperature drops in the developing universe, according to standard models, more and more form comes into being. First you get uh, atoms, then stars and galaxies condense, then you get solar systems, and through the cooling of matter you can get planets. The planets are the cooled remnants of exploding stars. The elements in our us and in our planets are stardust, formed from supernovae. So this, the, there's a cooling down of these things that came from immensely hot sources. Then you can get rocks forming crystals. And um, in a sufficiently cool planet, and yet a sufficiently warm one, within a fairly narrow range of temperature, uh, you can have the evolution of life as we have had on Earth. So this appearance of forms <coughs> comes out of a, an initial state where these forms are not present, and they appear through a kind of cooling. There's a formative process going on, and we can call this one way of looking at the emergence of form from chaos or disorder. Well, how do these forms come into being? This is the big problem of evolutionary creativity. How do the first molecules, how did the first zinc atoms come into being? How did the first methane molecules, how did the first salt crystals, how did the first living cells, how did the first vertebrates, how did the first of anything come into being in this evolving universe as it expanded and cooled? Well, <clears throat> one way of looking at this is to see the expansion and cooling process and indeed the flow of events as being, thinking of it in terms of the flux, flux of energy. And one of the great unifying concepts of 19th century physics is a unified conception of energy. Now, it's not entirely clear what energy is. Energy, in some sense, is the principle of change. The more there is, the more change that can be brought about. It's, in a, in a sense, a causative principle. Um, and it's a causative principle which exists in a process. And this process, the energetic flux of the universe, underlies time, change, becoming, and uh, the, the flux process itself seems to have an inherent indeterminism to it. This flux process, the universal flux, is organized into forms by fields. Matter is now thought of as energy bound within fields, the quantum matter fields and the fields of molecules and so on. And I think there are many of these organizing fields, the morphic fields. And uh, the fields are somehow organizing the ongoing flux of energy, which is always associated with this spontaneity and chaotic qualities. So even organized systems of a high level of complexity still have this probabilistic quality. The fields that organize this energy to give rise to material and physical forms um, are themselves probabilistic. Chaos is never eliminated. There's always this indeterminism or spontaneity at all levels of organization. So there's a formative principle, which is the fields, and there's an energetic principle, um, which I think has the chaos inherent in it. It's a kind of change which left as pure change would be chaos. One way of thinking of these is in terms of the Indian notion of, sh of Shakti as the energy indeterminate principle and Shiva as the formative principle working together in a kind of tantric union to give the world that we know. Now, <clears throat> if there's this formative principle that comes through the fields of nature, then one of the questions is, how do fields operate? How are these fields governed? How do they have the forms, shapes, and properties they do? Well, I think that the, the organizing fields of uh, living organisms, of crystals, of molecules, and so on, are uh, organized by, uh, I think that they are what I call morphic fields, and that these fields contain an inherent memory, so that um, these fields are essentially habitual, and nature is the uh, theater of these habitual fields organizing the indeterminate flux of energy. Fields themselves, by having this energy within them, have this indeterminate quality too. 
But this then brings us to the question of creativity. How do new fields, new forms, come into being in the first place? Where do they come from? Well, this morning, um, with Terence, I was discussing how they may arise out of the interaction between chaos and some kind of formative, unifying, some kind of unifying aspect of the cosmic mind, um, which uh, Ralph has hijacked for the Pythagorean sect by calling the realm of mathematics. Um, that there's a, a, an interaction here between these two levels, giving the world of becoming that he's shown by the wiggly line in the middle. Well, this is one way of looking at it. And this brings us back to the question of the nature of what he calls the mathematical realm, this sort of formative realm. Um, is, it, is there a kind of mathematical realm before the universe, somehow beyond space and time altogether, which conditions all forms of creativity, all patterns and possible uh, systems of organization that come into, can come into being with the world? Or are these all made up as the evolutionary process goes along? These are questions we've already touched on this morning. <clears throat> I, myth I myself think that um, if we take the view of things coming into being as evolution goes along, if we think of the cosmic, uh, the soul of the world as having a kind of imagination, uh, we can think of these as coming into being as nature goes along, and we can see this imagination as having many levels. There'd be a kind of cosmic imagination, uh, which would be the soul of the world the anima mundi, the soul of the universe, um, a cosmic mind, soul, and imagination. Within that, there would be clusters of galaxies, each of which would have their own mind, soul, or imagination. Then there would be galactic ones, then ones for solar systems, then ones for planets, and then ones for ecosystems, then ones for societies of organisms and individual organisms, organs, tissues, and so on. Um, there would be many levels of... Um, organizing soul. I think these morphic fields could be regarded as an aspect of the souls of systems at different levels of being. Um, then there'd be the possibility of a whole range of imaginations that uh, we don't have to leap straight from what's happening in a social insect uh, colony um, or in an, in an animal or a plant or in a social system, a human social system, straight to the... <coughs> divine imagination or the mathematical mind of God or the transcendent realm of mathematics. There's a whole level of imaginations in between. A whole level, um, and within the earth, we're embedded within the solar system with its own particular kind of soul and imagination and that within the galaxy. So there'd be a whole set of levels uh, at which creativity could come forth from uh, souls with imaginations. Now, <clears throat> I think the difference that we might have to consider between all this and the traditional doctrine of the world soul um, is that in the traditional doctrine of the world soul of Plotinus and of Plato, um, they had a threefold system where there was the intellect with the intelligence, uh, which was really the realm of forms or ideas or the logos. And embedded within that was the world soul, which had as its characteristic an attractor, it, the world soul had space and time within it and was concerned with the realm of becoming, namely the cosmos, not with the realm of being, which was the realm of these pure forms. And as the prototype of the cosmos, the world soul had this cosmic attractor as its entelechy, its goal. Um, and this was a striving towards the eternal perfection of the divine. And then within the world soul, there were hosts, hierarchical levels within levels, of souls of all the different systems within the universe, um, each of which had its own autonomous existence. Um, a, a holistic or holarchic uh, vision of souls within souls. The view that they had was that the qualities of the world soul were all fixed in, by the eternal forms, the eternal mathematical mind. The view that I want to consider is that the world soul or the world imagination makes up these forms as it goes along, that there isn't out there a kind of mathematical mind already fixed, already full, that 
the, what we do is make mathematical models of various aspects of nature. And um, I think that the one way, one thing that happens then is these models can be projected as if they're uh, a real thing out there, as if the world soul is engulfed within a kind of eternal mathematical mind. That may just be a projection of ours. The world soul may have an autonomy. It may be no more mathematical than our own souls are when we're dreaming. I mean, there are certain numbers and numerical forms come into dreams, but there's no sense when we're dreaming that these dreams are being generated by equations or that they're essentially mathematical in structure. So what I'm suggesting is that the, the world soul may have an autonomy to it. It may have a kind of mathematical realm as part of it. Um, but, but if we think of it as having its relation to mathematics and its relation to the creation of form, the ordering of chaos into patterns and forms and structures, then um, this mathematical aspect of it may evolve along with nature, just as our own understanding of mathematics evolves in time. Well, I think that um, we are talking about uh, complicated things, complex, obtuse, and, and uh, difficult ideas, and we're um, talking about them in a language which seems more or less appropriate. So as you speak, I get an idea, I get a picture. I mean, for me, it's frequently a picture. And I, I don't see that mathematics is substantially different from verbal description as a strategy for making models. I mean, um, certainly, if you uh, talk about uh, Plotinus, for example, we have a really, uh, you described a geometric, a visualizable model for the all and everything, including within it uh, the world soul and so on. If we <clears throat> draw that as a picture instead of a word picture, then that's officially mathematics, that's geometry, that's a geometric model for the thing. I think that with mathematics we can make model for anything. And if um, you think there's a big bang, we can make a model for that. And if you think that there are, are three sexes on the moon, and then we can make a model for that, you see. So mathematics could be regarded as simply an extension of language. It's not that uh, mathematical laws describe the universe. I mean, it's true that that's uh, the old paradigm. But I'm thinking um, that mathematics is a particularly good language for describing, discussing, imagining things that are really complicated. And the more complex, the more structured, the more difficult to engulf in our minds, the more appropriate mathematics might be, or maybe music might be, but words, I think, are frequently inadequate, that they have uh, evolved, our language has evolved through the necessity of sharing our experience on a level of complexity which is more or less traditional, and which is inadequate to understand the whole world, or the world soul, or the ecosystem, the biosphere of planet Earth or something. So mathematics has only a little more magic than, than language. And we could say, well, the conservation of energy, that's a verbal description of something that you could also say mathematically. So I, I think that your uh, maligning mathematics in this way is unjustified. And I, I guess I've been quoted in the chaos book as saying that chaos theory is the biggest thing since the wheel. Well. I believe that. I also think the wheel was a really big thing. But on the other hand, I've been quoted as saying that uh, chaos theory is no big deal. So whatever you say, I agree with you. <laughs> but, um, I mean, about determinism, if I could reply to that, it's a long time ago, but that was, you said you had a complaint about chaos theory, about determinism and prediction. And uh, there are two or three reasons why chaos theory is good for you. Uh, one thing is if you accepted chaos theory as a way of modeling anything that we're interested in, which personally I don't, uh, not by itself, it's too simple, then um, it's still good for you because 
according to chaos theory, prediction and determinism are impossible. Even though it uses the language that the deterministic thinkers used, it, when you look into the technical details of it, prediction is impossible. You only get a sort of a probabilistic something or other. Secondly, the models for anything that you want to talk about, such as cooling is a good one, um, they don't come from chaos theory, they come from bifurcation theory. And that is really good for you, because bifurcation theory is, exemplifies the best in mathematics. The most it can possibly do for you is rule out a lot of possibilities that you might imagine might happen, and then the mathematics says, well, no, in the, according to the assumptions that you said you believe, then all this won't happen, only this. And then you get a list of three or four of these so-called bifurcations. They are the only things you're going to expect to see in any system which is well modeled by the theory where these models come from. So when you have cooling, then you have, let us say, a control knob where you're turning down the heat under the pan, and the boiling is gradually subsiding to simmering, which is subsiding to a little bit of waving, which is subsiding to nothing. Then we have, at each stage, coming from the mathematics, a model which has attractors, which has maybe chaotic attractors. But every time you change the knob, you get a different model. And therefore, if you can't predict how the knob is going to change, the models don't give any prediction at all, and, and they're, they're irrelevant. And the only interesting thing is that the theory can tell you certain transformations you'll expect and others not. For example, Terence had pointed to the punctual aspect of evolution, that many transformations are saltatory, they are catastrophic, they are abrupt. And here the theory comes in and saying models of this type in this theory, most of the transformations are abrupt. And they have kind of a theory why, which is a geometrical model, which is only of use to those people who are who are thinking of the structure of the theory as opposed to what is happening in the ordinary world. So this bifurcation theory is good for you, and it gets rid of all, if chaos theory wasn't enough, that says determinism is impossible, using mathematical models, forget it. Then we don't even think the, those models are appropriate anyway. Instead, you have these models that are changed by a parameter, which uh, experience bifurcations. We have a very good encyclopedia of bifurcations, and those are good models for sudden changes, as, for example, in the emergence of form, as, for example, in the Neolithic Revolution, as, for example, in the crystallization of the planets, of the stardust. So that's uh, the, the good news. But the truth is that this theory can be used to model everything, so it never settles any question as to the origin of things or the true nature of the ordinary reality. And therefore, it's worthless. What's good about it, like language, is it's good for communication, it's good for a certain feeling of understanding and gaining comfort in a new environment because modeling is part of our basic process of grokking. And always the models are no good. They're no good as models, but they're good for the growth of understanding, the evolution of understanding. <clears throat> well, I mean, the, the, you put the whole case uh, impressively and modestly, in the sense that you're claiming that mathematicians are making models. Here's a new range of models. I mean, it's, it's like... Before, there were only mechanical instruments, and now we've got electronic instruments. A whole new category of models have come onto the market. And we can look forward to more models in the future. And, and there'll be the latest, the 1990 model will soon be out. And um, We've got this ongoing evolutionary system of mathematical models, which enable us to model various aspects of reality. This seems to me eminently modest claim. Um, but I suspect there's more in the background, because... The, at least there is for some people, because the traditional assumption is that these models correspond to something. The reason why they work is because there's some aspect of nature to, to which they mysteriously relate. And that aspect of nature is, in essence, mathematical, which is why mathematical modeling is possible. Now, this seems to me the interesting question. Why mathematical models work in certain areas? 
there are large areas where they don't work and they aren't used. Maybe they could be used and they could work. But I mean, I'm often meeting mathematicians or physicists who say quantum physics is the most brilliant predictive system that mankind has ever known. It predicts things to the 25 places of decimals, and uh, it's obviously correct. Well, as an agricultural scientist when I was working in India, you know, pre predicting the outcomes of my crop experiments, uh, there was nobody who could predict those. And those, those experiments were, I mean, vast distance beyond the capabilities of any physical, quantum physical modeling process or anything based on the so-called fundamental principles of physics. Um, you can produce sort of string and sealing wax models for, agri for crop production and we had people doing that. We had a computer and there were these uh, simple models. Um, but it wasn't that they didn't seem to me to be pointing towards a convincing demonstration that the whole thing depended on a hidden mathematical order. It, there were phenomena going on. The, some of them mathematicians have modeled fairly well. Others, there's huge areas of reality that are hardly modeled at all yet. Um, but the question is, is, there a, is it that mathematical models somehow fix on features of the fields of reality? Are the fields of reality more real than the models we use to model them with? Or is there a kind of mathematics yet more fundamental than the fields? Is the electromagnetic field, the magnetic field, for example, the north and south poles of the magnet, is that field polar? In the sense it has a north pole and a south pole. It has, clearly has a polarity. And is the electromagnetic field polar uh, in, in electric charge as well? There's a positive and there's a negative charges. These polarities we find inherent, for example, in the electrical and magnetic fields, are those because there's some kind of Pythagorean two system or duality in some archetypal realm beyond nature that's reflected in everything that happens in nature? Or is that just the way fields are? And that when we look at lots of fields, we make an abstraction and we make conscious in a mathematical model something which is inherent in the nature of the organizing fields of reality, but which doesn't exist in some transcendent mathematical realm. Well, you could ask different mathematicians and get different answers. I'll give you mine. Mm -hmm. And um, other mathematicians would say, it doesn't count because I'm not a mathematician. And this, uh, this answer, in fact, is the proof of that. But I think that, um, for me, mathematics is a beautiful landscape, an alternate reality. And there's um, infinite possibilities not yet uh, loomed into view, not seen, but I suppose they exist. It's just a fantasy. And there may be other parts which don't exist, but they'll be created by the efforts of people such as myself who just go there all the time and uh, hang out there and study there and give it energy, which is the nutrition and so on. So there is some older part and some, some younger part in the mathematical landscape. and this uh, entire system is in co-evolution, I suppose, with the evolution in ordinary reality. In this mathematical landscape, there is only small parts which have been used and probably ever will be used for modeling anything in ordinary reality. From the viewpoint of any non-mathematician, which is almost everyone, then those pieces of mathematics that have been used by somebody for modeling something familiar, like the simmering in the bottom of the, in, in the boiling water. Those parts are the only parts of mathematics that are visible. So then they proclaim how amazing the perfect fit between the mathematical concept evolved solely in the context of the human mind and this boiling pot of water. How amazing. Uh, something real, something only in the mind, the resonance, you see, but it's just like some small parts of mathematics that have ever become visible in that way. Furthermore, they became visible primarily in the context of mathematical physics. And mathematical physics, I guess, is unfortunately an evolutionary dead end. So you have to carefully watch out to take any inspiration from it, especially something like quantum electrodynamics. You have... Uh, a really good one, you know, mathematical physicist such as Stephen Hawking's going on record in several of his books saying that theoretical physics is done. Everything we can figure out is figured out now. 
and other theoretical physicists would like to say, I'm sure that, you know, we'll progress a little further. But basically, although Hawking is probably wrong, in essence, he's kind of right. Because this whole subject is devoted to the study of the simplest possible systems. Now, when you talk about your experience as agricultural scientist and so on, there you are talking of experience in a realm which is infinitely more complicated than the most complex system that a physicist ever looked at. So the parts of mathematics that have been used by these physicists are the parts that are the least interesting to us. And I want to tell you this good news that, at least in my opinion, mathematics offers much more to the more complex sciences than it offers to physics. And the whole potential of mathematics to aid us in our own evolution comes from the fact that it can extend our understanding of systems that are too complex to understand without it. It might be good for that, you see. Mm -hmm. So that when you just change the weather a little bit and these peas grow at the expense of those and so on, the understanding of that complexity could be aided. I mean, in any ecosystem, you have so many different things. You talk about the butterfly effect, and uh, we don't know that uh, one oil spill off the coast here could produce desertification and bring on the equivalent of nuclear winter. This is possible, but we don't understand it, and we never will, but our understanding can be advanced by mathematics, because mathematics is the supreme tool for the extension of our language for dealing with complex systems. That's its main appeal for application, for ordinary use, for garden variety life. We can have models of emotional relationships, of love affairs, of arms race between nations, of the nuclear club, of the United Nations, of the society of people, of nations, of the society of species, and, and so on. We can model these things with models that are no good, but they're better than no models. And the construction of these models is part of our evolution and is part of the evolution of the mathematical landscape as well. Yes. Well, that's all very moderate and reasonable. <laughs> no extravagant platonic claims. Um, uh, what interests me, I must admit that my interest in mathematical models has enormously increased since I came across attractors. And my ability to understand attractors, or at least even a little bit about them, was greatly increased by your visual dynamics books, which for the first time made these things uh, visible. I should say, for those who haven't followed Ralph's work, that he's done more than any mathematician I know to make the essential features of this mathematics visible. He's produced a four, volume, uh, four volumes of books on dynamics, visual dynamics, there's not a single equation in the four volumes. And through diagrams, he tries to give you the essence of what dynamic systems are and what the science, the mathematical branch of dynamics is, how it models them and how it understands them. It's very illuminating. And normally, mathematics is hidden between, behind an opaque cloud of symbols, which most of us can't penetrate beyond. It's as if all we knew of music was looking at scores of symphonies, but never actually hearing the symphony. These symbols refer to things which, for real mathematicians, are intuitions, visual intuitions. And um, so Ralph helps uh, make that clear. But what interests me is, in, the, in these attractors, um, no one else in any other branch of science has been able to think in terms of teleological principles which pull from in front. And mathematicians have sort of snuck in round the back and because it's an abstruse branch of an abstruse subject, uh, which the, the anti-teleological inquisitions of modern science don't really understand very much, it's somehow grown up in the back uh, without anyone noticing. And now we've got this whole system of dynamical attractors, including chaotic attractors, um, that have been developing for years without uh, those who police the frontiers of science noticing what was going on. Sort of illicit crops of models have grown up in clearings and backyards, as it were. Um, and it seems to me that they've really quite changed our way of thinking about nature because they have made it conceivable to think of what Aristotle called the entelechy or what uh, the, this dynamical, this pulling process. Now, what I'd like to know is, is how you think um, 
attractors work. I mean, I know you'll say that all we're doing is modeling what actually happens. We're not saying anything about the underlying reality or fields or structures that make it happen. We're just describing or modeling what actually happens in the physical world. Um, the interesting thing is the models of attractors imply that a future state draws the system towards it. And I suppose you can say, well, the model isn't in the future or the state isn't really in the future. It's only a description of what you've observed in the past. The fact is, however, one tries to get out of what they do seem to be dealing with a new conception of pulling rather than pushing something that's more Aristotelian than mechanistic. So it involves um, pulling from the transport for the logical reason. You know, you never get from the dense thing because that seems to me really an attractor for the entire cosmic evolution process. Well, I have to admit that when I heard this.
that sounds as if it be that person who pretends that actually it's just a case of all she's going to call it some wonders. We need any physics and triumph of the atmospheric system in my opinion very much because what in the seeking to deny was introduced into it by a kind of subterfuge and pretended that this was a mechanical possible or that was something else. And I suspect that the same is true with your undoubted attractions to myself and um you see, I think if you take an example of the train, the station is put in the train, and in a sense what's motivating the train is the purpose of the people getting to New York or Los Angeles or London, and yes, human beings were purpose of the destinations they wanted to get to, and that's where we come to these schedules and drive the way we ran the trains in accordance with what they thought supply and demand was. Um, that train wouldn't be running. There's a sense in which the station is an attractor. If I want to go by train to London, um, I get on the train that's going to London because it says it's my purpose to go to London. And I don't know that the train can be modeled. This is an attractor, but actually it's just a fixed system, a dynamical system running on the rails that happens to end up. Well, if you observe enough trains on the road, you know you see lots of things along the same with the model of the and the tractor, but it's got nothing to do with the traction. That's, in a sense, a subterfuge because it has got a great deal to do with the traction. People are now their lives running their life, particularly with the native people traveling on the road. Well, I think I can make up this person now because they said there's nothing wrong. Um, so, I think you see that, that there is this implication, I think even in your chosen example, it's really there. Well, I think it's a good uh, analogy with Newton's attraction. And there are, with his theory, or equally a general relativity, some unresolved difficult problems about action at a distance. Action at a distance in space. And I think that we have the same thing here, but it's a question of action at a distance in time. And <clears throat> there are two different times that are being confused, but I think the idea of two-dimensional time that a couple of people already suggested could aid us here. The, uh, the train that goes down to the track and arrives at the station is the tractor, but it's not actually pulling uh, the train. So there is an action um, at the given instant before the train arrives at the station, you know, the station is still in the future. The problem with thinking of the train, the station pulling the train, is that the, the cause is going in the future. That's the problem with this geological uh, approach. However, uh, your argument that the station pulls the train because the people who are going to have a price to a different kind of time. And that's the time of the scale of the evolution of the train system. It used to get off the train at our original station. They asked the conductor for it to stop, and I can leave people dead, and then they build the station here, and so on. So uh, I think a very interesting thing, rather than a dynamical model, um, you know, a tractor is that someone has the uh, exciting influence of the past to approach the a more interesting idea is to make a model for evolution itself, in which the train system with its greatest distribution of stations in the location of towns the size of Russia, as opposed to the size of Great Britain, so on. All of this is e evolving slowly in the course of another kind of time, a time of the end of centuries. And there we have the, this pattern is coming forth. Um, a trajectory in another space, which is also going to track down, which is the final configuration, the city plan, the location of cities, the network of train tracks, and so on. And the theological art is also going toward an attractor, but is it being pulled by the attractor? So I think uh, it's not because the, the, the people are having to be, you know, are getting a little off the train wherever they want, and that's the real cause, as it were, the determinant of the evolution is the frame of the moment, as the collective action of the citizens of the present. Well, that's one more thing I said before we asked Terence for his opinion. There's a sense in which we face this problem in our own psychology, and there's a sense in which our own motivations, um, motivations, and we want to 
psychological sense and not pushing from behind but pulling from the head. And of course, the law of decisions established the cause of what happened. Medical education is very important. It did sound so willfully, but it did sound so willfully. But if so, what is their motive? The motive isn't what they I mean, if they did it in order to kill them, in order to inherit money, that they would inherit through their will. The sense in which a future state or an imagined future state is not pulling them. And the sense in which, by our own motivation, we have desires and goals, we have purposes and aims, even if just by trying to mess up as we can, we always have the intention of getting here, and uh, the intention of conceiving our coming here. And the sense in which the goal of being here gets them is we can grow our behavior towards it, and that goal is in the future. So this is that we face the same problem with people who have their psychological motivations, which we know most about, and we know more about our own motivations and about the functioning of the course of nature. And I would have thought exactly the same problems arose. And the concept of morphic effect and the morphic resonance theory and in Aristotle's notion of the soul, the concept of mentality, is trying to deal with this fact that somehow in the present, um, the system, the person, the developing animal, the developing plant in the present is subject to the influence of a potential future state that hasn't yet come into being. But that future state is one directs and guides and attacks the development of the present system. Now, it's, is that future state existing in the present in some other dimension or direction or time? Or are they actually out there in the future and pulling from tomorrow or the day after tomorrow through time? I mean, these may be just different ways of trying to imagine how this is where we've arrived at the imagination. Exactly. <laughs> Oh, very interesting. I had a lot to say about the earlier part, but I'll work backwards through it. Um, I think Whitehead had a phrase called appetition for completion, which is, I think, to be what this attractor notion um, is seeking to concretize. If we didn't use the word attractor to try to be true to the notion that the thing was being pushed from behind the process, then we would have to use a word like the propeller or the motivator. And in, and in these cases, I think intuitively, or perhaps it's just the habit of my own thinking, these seem to be inelegant terms. They seem to immediately raise questions of operational details that attract or doesn't. We know how things are attracted to something. They simply move toward them. But if something is propelled towards something, if something is motivated towards something, then we have to visualize an engine strapped to it that is moving it toward a, an end state which it somehow is able to magically find where if you view the attractor as the bottom of an energy well, well then anything put into the energy well will make its way to the attractor because the attractor is uh, the least energetic state. And so the whole system uh, tends to move in that direction. The idea that the cause is in the future makes hash of the notion of causality. And so this is, I think, on the part of science, something that they are very concerned to eliminate because it will, the backwash from that assumption will make the practice of science uh, much more difficult. Nevertheless, uh, you know, Ralph and his colleagues have been modeling for many years now plant growth, dripping faucets, uh, coupled oscillators like groups of cuckoo clocks hung on the wall and this sort of thing. Uh, the, the modeling task, ni plus ultra, is history. Uh, this is where you're no longer playing a little game to demonstrate something to a group of students or colleagues, but where you actually are saying our models, our methods, are powerful enough that now 
now we will take on the real world, not even the real world of biology, but the real world of the felt experience of being embedded in human institutions. Well, when you look at history, I think the whole reason history has bogged down in the 20th century is because of the absence of belief in an attractor. This is the hideous legacy of existentialism and uh, all the philosophies constellated around it, that there is no attractor, there is no appetition for completion. Everything is referent to the past up through the present and no further. So that's what I think about the last part of the thing. What interested me more and is appealed more to my own kinkiness because it caused me to think something I had never thought before, even though on one level Richard was uh, <coughs> taking liberties with my material. <laughs> this notion about complexity and cooling I saw, perhaps because I heard it from his lips rather than my own, I saw a dimension which I had never seen before, which is my tendency is always to carry any principle to the uh, ultimate extrapolation. And uh, if, in fact, the increase of complexity in the life of the universe is directly related to falling temperatures in the universe, then it seems to me it's reasonable to suppose that the most complex states in the projective history of the universe will occur at very low temperatures. Well, isn't it interesting then that um, phenomena like superconductivity and stuff like that uh, has to do with low temperatures? And superconductivity is fascinating to cybernetic engineers because it's a way to preserve information from decay. You see, if you put information into a, a superconducting circuit operating around absolute zero, it will be impossible to disrupt that circuit without destroying it. And uh, people like uh, Erwin Schrodinger as early as the mid-30s suggested that since life seeks to stabilize itself against mutation, the obvious principle to be brought in to aid in that task would be something very much like superconductivity. Well, I don't want to belabor the point in my little space of time, but in fact the way in which charge transfer and things like that occur in DNA suggests that nature may have incorporated this principle into its mechanics. What this says to us in the present that is particularly poignant, I think, is that our cultural phase transition that we are going through vis-a-vis -vis machines <laughs> may signify that we are not, as I have always thought, very close to the maximized state of novelty, but that we're somewhere out in the middle of that wave it goes from the beginning to the end, and that what the cultural transition that we are doing is about is we are downloading all novelty uh, so far achieved into a much colder and stabler regime, the cold and stable regime of silicon crystals and arsenic doped uh, chips and this sort of thing. And that and this is, you know, a fairly appalling idea because I think we all have a horror of being replaced by machines. But on the other hand, prokaryotes were replaced by eukaryotes, and uh, uh, there have been several of these replacement scenarios in the history of life. So I think it's interesting that uh, that you make this point about cooling and complexity, it seems to me to imply that in my own theory, the zero point may in fact be the absolute zero point. And that what the, what the time wave or the fractal of time really describes is uh, the fluctuation of the career of heat over the life of the universe. And that in domains of high heat, information is degraded 
and novelty is lost and there is a kind of recidivist tendency and when temperatures fall, order reasserts itself and, uh, and stabilizes. Well, I think that the storage in low temperatures is interesting because I think one of the things when Ralph said that mathematics is like language as a modeling system, um, I think there's a very big difference between spoken language and written language. When you get written language, the first ones we know about are written on rocks, the ultimate low temperature crystalline storage system. Uh, the, the Ten Commandments as given to Moses were written on tablets of stone. I mean, this is this kind of permanent storage system. And, and you know, putting things in silicon crystals is a more sophisticated way, but this is essentially a low temperature storage method. You couldn't do it, you couldn't write on, on water um, or in the wind. Um, so, I think that this language, and the written language, creates the illusion for us of an independent world. I think the realm, I myself think the notion of platonic forms and this ideal, uh, this transcendent eternal world couldn't have arisen until written language had arisen because written language produced the model and by what I think of as a kind of idolatry, these man-made symbols and structures, languages and mathematics, when written down, can be imagined to endure forever in some kind of other realm as if there's some kind of celestial rock or celestial stone or celestial crystal in which they endure forever. But the reality of language as it's existed for a far longer period of its history and as it exists right now here as we talk to each other is in spoken language. And spoken language is a process that happens in time and the memory involved in spoken language which it comes when stories are retold like the bards and, and, and the transmission in oral cultures there is no written record, so the spoken record, the, the story, organically develops as time goes on. And there's nobody around to say, well, look, you've got the story wrong because in the book it's written like this. The thing organically uh, evolves. And so I think a model of language is a kind of model of reality. An oral tradition has this constantly evolving and, conserved, and yet conserved model. But as soon as you've got a written one, as soon as you've got written records or written mathematical formulae, you get the impression, an imaginary realm of uh, sort of eternal forms by just sort of projecting the notion of things written down. Anyway, that was just what I wanted to say in response to what you said. And I think that's one way in which we get this, or we could easily get, I'm not saying for sure the mathematical, the platonic or Pythagorean realm is an illusion, but it would be easy to see how such an illusion could be produced. Well, I imagine, <coughs> just to be contrary, that mathematics preceded not only writing, but mathematics probably preceded language as well. Certainly, mathematics preceded writing. And in mathematics, we have, for example, a circle, a line. I mean, these are, for Plato, the ideal ideals. Right? So do, do we, we need writing on stone? to think of uh, a line or a circle or a triangle as being um, eternal form. And uh, the evolution of this kind of mathematics preceding writing was probably done by drawing in sand. And writing evolved by drawing in sand, and only later you had drawing on stone. So <clears throat> I think, I mean, it's just possible that the... Uh, the idea of eternal forms, laws, and so on e emerged before writing on stone, and that writing on stone was just, as a matter of fact, a concretization of those. It just suggests a migration in uh, evolution from the immaterial to the material, from the abstract to the concrete. I mean, it's the opposite of what a lot of people think. Um, these, your theories are the theories of chaos. Using this gentleman's here, is this a model? How does it relate to, is it a model for the chaos in society in our world today? And what does it tell you about that? And yeah, I used to uh, answer when I went on the airplane and the person in the next seat would say, what, would, what do you do? And I said, oh, well, I'm, I'm a math professor. I do research in mathematics. And then they always say, 
that's my worst subject, and the conversation would end. <laughs> so I soon learned to pretend that it was something else. Well, I write books. Oh, yeah? What kind of books? Well, textbooks. Well, that would you know, end the conversation. <laughs> well, well, once, as a kind of accident, I said, well, I study chaos theory. And the person immediately said, now that's a subject I know a lot about. <laughs> that was many years ago, but I rejected that. And so at that point, I would have answered to your question, no. I didn't think there was very much relationship between um, mo mathematical models with chaotic behavior on the one hand and the chaos in life, what people are talking about when they say that's something I know a lot about, they're talking about a problem in their relationship or in the middle of an argument with their mate or something. So, um, but my attitude has changed over the years and more and more I've been trying to make models in the social sciences in general and now I have, uh, for example, a project in psychoanalysis to model, working with a group of psychoanalysts, to model the therapeutic situation. And their idea was, I mean, in the experience of their practice of psychoanalysis, they had the feeling that the patient would present, that's a technical jargon, I gather, of that field, <laughs> would present uh, uh, chaotically that the presentation would become more chaotic and that was to them a clue that the trigger was approaching for an episode or something. So they came to me saying, could you model this? Could we have data where we could sort of meter the extent of chaos, like my parameter GN in the, in the ocean? And uh, that was a few years ago and so it's progressed and now I'm working on, I call it aerodynamics, E-R-O, um, models for the love relationship and for the synergy of in society, social synergy in a group of nations, for example, what does lead to war and what leads to cooperation, how do you resolve conflict and so on. So I do feel that it is, I won't say possible, it's conceivable in course of time, given its adequate evolution of the modeling art of this hermeneutical circle that gentleman has described so well in the context of the ships and the models for the ships, that we could reach a point where we had models that were decent in some sense to aid us in the understanding of complex social relationships. Um, a group of people like two, three, a group this size, a group of nations, a world of nations, the evolution of society, and Terence's dream, a model for history itself. This is kind of, it's thinkable. It's not unthinkable. We're not at a point where we can meter the chaos in the Roman, say, they're about to break for dinner. Isn't what you're doing today and yesterday to let us that with the with the um, thing that she's done with the, the, the humming and so forth? It, it is presuming that we are all somehow going to get together through this in some way, make it better for us to communicate and be in the room through this particular instrument. Yes. Um, and in relationships. When I know that relationships and working with people is a lot about energy. And the energy that gets or doesn't get uh, focused with, with the two or three or get a group of eight or whatever. And it's, it's a lot of working with that energy. Well, I'm delighted to hear this optimism because I had recently, uh, a month or two or three ago, given a talk here to a group of social scientists about the possibilities of mathematical modeling. And uh, their response was really angry and hostile. The very idea of a mathematical anthropology or a mathematical sociology, they thought, was really offensive. Right. It reminds me. It reminds me of when catastrophe theory had come out, and people were looking at using it for politics, especially um, revolutionary politics. That there are certain political and social changes which occur peacefully and in an incremental manner, but those same changes will occur catastrophically if, for example, the economy is in trouble. So they were they were attempting to use catastrophe theory <coughs> to model politics. They weren't able to get enough data, I think, to make a practical. 
model. Actually, that's a good case because it was very promising. It's still very promising, but it suffered a kind of a sociological or historical accident where a wave of uh, popular hostility built up over catastrophe theory in a series of newspaper articles and within the mathematical community, and it killed it. It killed a very promising strategy of model building for the social sciences. Anyway, it was very limited. It was a temporary stage on the way to what we are doing now with, with these systems. And I don't know if it will save the world or anything, but I can tell you it's a lot of fun. Ralph, in line with the question about sociology, I haven't asked you this question for a couple of years. I ask it every couple of years. Do you still cling to the mathematical proof of the impossibility of monogamy? <laughs> I, I don't remember your asking that two years ago, Terence, nor, nor ever before. Uh, Do you remember making the statement? I not only I don't remember, but I, I, I say I proclaim to you all it's impossible I ever made it, such a statement because, as I've just explained uh, to Rupert, I don't believe and the resonance between the models and the actuality of ordinary life. I think that it emerges our, it evolves our understanding to play with models. Well, they do have a certain practical value, but I don't consider that the interesting part. So if I had a mathematical proof of the impossible of, impossibility of monogamy in a certain model universe of model relationship in, in level three, I might have spoken about that, and you made what Gregory Basin called a category error and thought I was talking about <laughs> human relationship, but you know I'd never actually speak about human relationship. I wish you told me this years ago. <laughs> Shall we stop? This, this whole... Uh, notion of the role of modeling, uh, I find very uh, simple to the discussion, especially where it's tied in with the feedback to uh, between the, uh, the abstracting and the concretizing and blends them together. So your model is sail your model out and, uh, and, and it keeps changing itself. Um, and, and, and tied to the, this notion of the attractor, it, if you model an attractor, does your model have attractive properties? Does it begin to become uh, a concrete, uh, an attractive entity? Uh, we'll have to ask Terence about this, since he's been using this word extensively today, appetition. And I don't know exactly what it means. Um, Terence, are models attractive? I mean, are they habit forming? Is modeling a habit? I think so. I think if a model is a good model, it will um, it will attract. It will begin to attract. <laughs> it will begin to pull uh, energy toward itself. It's almost like the idea of the self fulfilling prophecy. And in a way, that's what I see the three of us and others mentionable as doing. We're, we're trying to create a self-fulfilling prophecy where it's such a good idea that it will act as an attractor and the world will move. Yes, a good dream for a future with a future. Yes. Well, maybe it's an appropriate time just to make mention of this area of mythology and ritual. That uh, here we have a kind of model which has been thought to be crucial for the evolution of a society. And it could be that certain models are attractive in that realm. For example, the Trinity or one God. I think that um, it's possible, I mean, there's an alternative possibility in that the models aren't attractive exactly, but you have uh, springing up thousands of new societies around the planet every few years and some of them will survive. They're like mutations in the 
social sphere, and some will survive for a while and others not. And some may have a really huge history, like 3,000 or 5,000 years, or our civilization. And how old is this one? It starts with the Renaissance or in the time of Christ. Is say in the Renaissance, this particular model with its very complicated pantheon of gods and goddesses. Um, I, th I think it could be natural selection of societies that have adopted a certain model and made it a habit, whether attractive or not. And then the longevity is not because the model is attractive, but because it has a certain evolutionary advantage or advantage in whatever is the selection mechanism. Or it could be that certain models, like the Trinity, are intrinsically attractive, and that's why there are so many societies with uh, Trinity as their model, which had a long lifetime. Well, the only thing I just to follow up, uh, where does it make it over? You know, where does it, the model cross over? When does Frankenstein's monster get, you know, citizenship papers? Or, uh, you know, how, does, how does the model stay not part of the real world? You see what I'm saying? Or trying to get at here? The, the, the model becomes it. But the model oh, takes on a kind of social reality, doesn't it? In, in a religious system, like Islam, for example, the, the model of, of God, which Islam has, this strongly em emphasized monotheism, actually takes on a social reality. It's reflected if you have one God, then the, then the earth is sacred, but then you have the idea there should be one sacred place on earth. So you have all pilgrimage to Mecca, all mosques pointing Mecca, to Mecca. You have one God mirrored in this one central. So you have a model actually becoming social reality. This is a common thing. But there's one, let me just conclude one further thought on this line. Um, I think that the history of religions is one of the things that it tells us is that all temples, images, um, diagrams, all the paraphernalia of religion, um, uh, ritual forms, in some sense have a modeling function. Some of them may be symbols that participate with the reality they're describing. Um, and one of the constant dynamics in, in, in the history of uh, at least Western religions is the way in which the models uh, are taken to be the reality by people. It's a recurrent danger of models. And in the Judeo-Christian tradition, it's called idolatry. It's that the model of reality, the image of the God, is taken to be the God itself. Um, and I myself think that the, one of the problems of the mechanistic worldview is that the mathematical models of classical physics were taken by many people to be the actual reality governing the world. So the idea was there was this mathematical mind governing the world. And this became the god of the materialist or the atheist. This kind of, uh, the mathematical models, the I images of reality became the ultimate reality for them. Uh, a possible interesting example of, of, of a religio poetic myth becoming a powerful attractor. Uh, between the 11th and the 13th century in, in Western Europe, there was a very important paradigm shift took place, uh, namely the, the, the recognition of the importance of the feminine principle. And, and this uh, affected life in every way. Uh, one of the ways to do this is to, is to see the shift in the style of architecture, say, between the, uh, the Romanesque uh, uh, construction that uh, was used in the older portions of the Abbey of Mont Saint Michel and, uh, say, the, uh, the uh, Cathedral de Chart. Now, Mont Saint Michel was built for the glorification of, of Saint Michael, who was the most powerful uh, of all the angels, the one that threw Satan out of heaven, a very masculine thing. It's a masculine building, very little decoration, thick walls very little, uh, small windows, uh, solidly built, uh, a masculine style of architecture. If you go to Chart, you see the apotheosis of the feminine style of architecture. This act, of, I, I think, is in the, in the sense of what you're calling a, an attractor, because between the 11th and the 13th century, beginning around the, the beginning of the 12th century, hundreds of these Gothic cathedrals were built in Europe all for the adoration of the Blessed Virgin. 
hundreds of them at an enormous expense, uh, an enormous effort. Uh, uh, remember, this is a poor time, and, and, and Europe put uh, an enormous amount of their effort into doing this, and I can only see this as the attractive power of the myth created around the film, is it? Well, I, it must be something like that. I mean, yeah. it, and it must be something to do with the feminine aspect of creativity. You see, yeah. one of the things that Ralph and I were thinking about earlier today, we were having a conversation uh, after lunch, um, that we find both masculine and feminine creative principles in mythology, and both masculine and feminine creative principles come in trinities quite frequently the triple goddess, uh, but then in the Christian world, the male trinity. And Ralph was saying, well, um, maybe there would be, uh, since there seems to be this possibility of looking at it either way, there must have been somewhere in which the two threes formed a six, and the two creative trinities interlaced. And then I uh, occurred to us that the, the um, Star of David is just such a diagram, two interpenetrating triangles. All the well, any six-fold structure. Anyway, this takes us into another realm of archetypes. It's six o'clock, and maybe it's time now to stop, because after supper, um, we come to Terence and Ralph on creation, uh, chaos and imagination. At eight o'clock. Eight o'clock.